Welcome back to part two of this topic. Um, we're just continuing on straight from a previous video where we covered these points. Uh, we need to cover the rest of the algorithms and two other points. If you're kind of tactically skipping the algorithms, uh, make sure you watch the last few minutes of this video because we are covering two other points, which I think you should know regardless. Um, but if you're just wondering why we didn't cover some of the other points in the last video, and we're not gonna cover them in this video either, is because these ones are very much either common sense or they're things I can't really teach you and this one for example is about coding something I'm not going to deal with for the exam and also things like programming constructs it mentions here we'll look at these in a future video in a lot more detail so we won't bother covering them twice um, but anyway if we move on to looking at our first algorithm and that's switching up a bit we're looking now at searching algorithms and what they do they just find a item in a list essentially and um, the simplest the least efficient method is linear search and this is kind of the one that you could ask a five-year-old to search for something and this is what they do. They literally check every single item in the list until you find your search item or you don't find it at all. Um, and as you can imagine, this isn't massively efficient or quick. Um, and yeah, when its item is found, its position can then be returned. This is how you, it depends on how you implement it really. But it's a very systematic brute force method for finding items and Obviously, the longer your list is, the longer it's going to take because that's to search every item until your list is until your item's found. If your item is near the beginning, then perhaps it won't take that long. But if it's near the end or not in there at all, it's going to take a long time. Um, this GIF is maybe not totally worth watching, but it's going to go along until it finds our intended item and then it will terminate. So there you go. That was worth two seconds watching that. So the next one we're going to look at is binary search. And binary search is slightly more elegant. Um, and what it does, it continually divides your list by two. Uh, binary we'll look at a ton more in this series because it's so fundamental. But binary is a base two system. And it's just dividing it by two each time. And what it can do, it eliminates the part of the list that cannot have your item in it. So the reason it can do this is because the list must be fully ordered. Linear search doesn't necessarily have to be ordered, in fact. There's no reason you'd use it if it's ordered, um, but binary search needs to be fully ordered, as we'll look at for reason in a second. So, just an example, but we'll look at a better one in a second. Um, so, the reason why it's so much better than linear search is if, for example, you had a million items in a list, in the worst case, the very worst case for binary search, it could be a lot quicker than this, you're going to have to make a maximum of 20 comparisons uh, compared to a maximum of a million comparisons for linear search. In linear search, you're going to have to check every single item anyway. I ignore this bit, I probably shouldn't have put that in. That's you probably haven't come across logarithms yet in your maths, that's sort of A-level maths, but we'll ignore that for now. So an example of finding, uh, using binary search, and that's to find six, in this case, we're going to use a wider list. So first thing we need to do is check that it's in order, and it is, it's in ascending order, um, and we'll look at why it's important in a second. So the first thing we can do, we can halve this list, and the half, the middle value in this list is 15, um, and because 6 is less than 15 and we know it's ordered, we can eliminate 15 and we can eliminate everything above 15. We know that because it's ordered in ascending order, 6 is not going to be above 15. And so we can eliminate everything above it, effectively doing this, just blanking it out. And so we're left with a newer list, and the middle point in this is going to be 5. Um, as we talked about in the previous video, I'm going to use the convention left of middle is the actual midpoint. And so 5 is our new middle value. and we can see that because 5 is less than 6, we can eliminate 5 and we can eliminate anything before it, which is just 3 in this case. So this bit goes, and we're left with 6 and 9, and our midpoint now is actually our search item, because we're midpoint is now going to be 6, and so we find it and we can ignore 9, and we're left with 6 being our item. So um, hopefully you can see what's being done there. It's very uh, efficient compared to linear search, but it has to be ordered beforehand. Okay, moving on to look at something slightly different. We're still looking at technically looking at search algorithms, but these are much more about transversing graphs in this case. So a graph, or we should say graph theory, is basically just an area of mathematics. And a graph itself is just a structure used to model relationships between objects. And the objects can be almost anything. So in this example of a graph, the objects are European cities. And the actual kind of objects, so these dots here, they're usually either called nodes or vertices and they're connected by the links which are called either edges or arcs and this is an example of something called a weighted graph where we apply or numerical values are given to the distances between the nodes and this is obviously modeling 
uh, the region in Europe. Um, but we need to look at two algorithms that can be used to transverse a graph. The first being breadth first search, it's relatively difficult to say, and depth first search. And so we, um, I imagine you don't need to know about this to a massive amount of detail. There's some detail I've left out of these slides because it's relatively complicated and I think it's a push for GCSE level and for example don't say anything about it which would be very unfair if they sprang it on you. But the, the way they work is breadth first search works by visiting the nodes closest to the starting point first and then it explores all their neighbours before proceeding to visit the nodes on the next level. Um, it, it wouldn't be that obvious on a graph like this but we'll look at in the next slide a much more hierarchical version which is really obvious what they're doing. Uh, depth first search is different in the fact that it explores as far into the graph as possible and then it backtracks to visit all the other nodes it hasn't visited yet and it works by moving it down each branch as opposed to along each level but this will be really obvious here so two uh, graphs here uh, different different numbers ignore that but they're the same layout and you can so if we look at how breadth first, breadth first search would go about transversing this. First of all, it's going to go along the first level and then it's going to go explore into the graph and go along each level and it very, it very much works across it when it looks like this layout. Whereas depth first search really explores into the graph as much as possible then it backtracks and does this. So there's quite a pronounced difference there. And the difference comes from the fact they use different data structures to store the unvisited nodes. So actually they're pretty much the same algorithm except they use different data structures to store the nodes. So BFS uses something called a queue and DFS uses a stack. And a queue is, this is perhaps going beyond your specification so maybe don't pay too much attention to this, but if you're wondering a queue is something called a first in first out structure. So like a queue in real life, if you're at the front of a queue, you expect to leave the queue first. Whereas a stack, so like a stack of, I don't know, dirty plates, if you were about to wash them, the plate you put on last is probably going to be the one you're going to wash first. So that's how they differ, and it causes this quite pronounced effect where they work in very different ways, or they at least transverse it in quite obviously different ways. Um, same result though, but it's a, quite an obvious example of how a data structure influences the algorithm, which is a point we have to look at a bit later on. Okay, we now change our focus again to looking at some numerical kind of based algorithms. So this one is for finding the maximum and minimum value in a list. So the first thing we should say is if you have a sorted list, so say it's sorted in ascending order, then you don't need to apply this. It's a lot of effort to go into for a sorted list because if you have, say, ascending items or numbers, then the smallest is going to be the one at the front and the largest is going to be the one at the top. So it's a lot of effort to go into for no reason. But this is dealing with unsorted lists. And what you could do, you could potentially just basically create a variable and loop through the list and update the variable as you find your current minimum and maximum value. And if you're doing it for both, you're going to have to do this whole process twice for both the minimum and maximum value. What you can do, you can be slightly cleverer and combine the two separate processes to result in fewer comparisons. Um, before we cover, just go through this, we'll just look at an example because it'll make more sense. So we start with a very small list here. I've uh, tried to conserve a bit of effort there. Um, got four items and these little boxes represent variables and variables just hold data. And so what we're doing, we're going to first of all compare the first two values in our list. So 5 and 9, which one's bigger? So 9's bigger than 5 and so we're going to essentially, we're going to be quite precise here, we've got to compare it with our current values in our variables and nothing's in our variables at the moment so they're just updated. So this purple one is representing the minimum value and this is our current maximum value. And so we move on to look at the next two the next two items, so four and two. Four is bigger than two, and so we now have to compare four, the larger, with the larger current value, and the smaller with the minimum current value. And so, because two is less than five, this needs to be updated, because we have found a new minimum. But four is less than nine, so that's not going to be updated. And our result is going to be our final values in our variable is going to be our minimum is going to be 2 and our maximum is going to be 9. So really what we're doing, if we skip back to the two points on the previous slide, what this means is instead of four comparisons per pair, so 
the first one we have to compare it to both the minimum and maximum and then same with the second one for total comparisons you actually only need to do three comparisons with this slightly two-step process so actually your total comparisons go from two times the number of items in the list to three over two times the number of items in the list so actually over a large list it's a relatively good effect so um, yeah if you actually have to implement this so this is one of the ones listed as you in your controlled assessment you may be asked to do it um, you may just find that if you find it easier to code say a sorting algorithm that might be easier to do they're actually relatively tricky some of them to code they're slightly trickier than they look some of the sorting algorithms but you may find that slightly better so if you sort it first and you have to be slightly you have to be slightly careful because it could be relatively easy to cause an error because if you had three items here or you had an odd number of items you're going to have a comparison against something that doesn't exist so you have to maybe add a line of code to make sure it's robust and can deal with that um, but anyway we move on to look at the next algorithm which is the mean so the mean is sometimes just called the average I'm sure you know the mean probably from quite a young age and literally the mean is you literally add up all, you add up everything in the list and divide it by how many items you have in the list so kind of formally it looks like this um, this sigma notation you might have come across this just means sum of so this is saying sum of all the items and then you divide it by the number of them relatively simple so this is an example of perhaps the steps of implementing it in pseudocode so this is just defining a function as our mean and um, you could probably to be fair combine this into perhaps two lines but it's just an example and then we're gonna basically submit our list to our function and we're gonna get a result of eight so we're first of all defining it then we're calling the function and eight is the result so this is probably the easiest one of them all and I'm sure you've done this from a very young age so it should be relatively straightforward uh, finally the last algorithm we need to look at is the count occurrences algorithm and this basically finds how many times a particular value exists in a list so again a relatively simple one to do I've just done an example of I mean this one could definitely be expanded and what this pseudocode does it takes a value from the user so it receives a value from the keyboard and compares it against a list of length 10 so we've got 1 to 10 here and we're talking about indexing here and we're assuming that we're not indexing starting from 0 we're assuming we're starting from 1 here uh, fortunately with pseudocode you can kind of do stuff for like that what you want so what it does it just loops through each index for position of a list and compares the item to the value at that point and if they're equal the counter increases so you might want to pause it and just see if you understand what's happening there but really this could be improved it's not very robust and this is very limited to a list of 10 items so there's definitely a way to improve it but this is a very simple example and you have to be slightly careful with data types because often you can see here we look at data types in a future video I'm pretty sure but uh, this is something called a string so kind of letters from a keyboard so that the number would be taken as kind of like a letter but we'll look at this later in a future video but we're comparing it against potentially integers so you have to be very careful with um, not causing type errors there but we move on to actually final kind of theoretical point and that's on data structures so this is like difficult as I say we cover the data type later and also data structure too but as we've looked at there's lots of different algorithms that can be used to solve the same problem we looked at a couple of sorting ones we looked at some searching ones and we looked at a few actual different ones to do with arithmetic and so certain algorithms only work with certain types of data so some will only work with integers some will only work with letters potentially and more so the case for data that has to be structured in a certain way so for example if the data arrangement is random and not sorted then really for a searching algorithm you have to do linear search which as we know checks everything so it's not the best option but you may be left with another choice if you're not willing to sort it first um, so yeah you could sort the data although you, you often need the items to be of either the same or a similar data type especially if you're doing it with a computer and then you can maybe use something like binary search which only works because it's well structured and sorted um, and again as we looked at as the two graph 
algorithms demonstrate, the way they work is drastically changed depending on the data structure um, they utilize. And it's probably a good point to just say that the colors are just to make it slightly less garish because a page of white text is maybe difficult on the eye. So if you're wondering why I've done certain colors, that's why. Um, so we now finally look at algorithm efficiency. And really, uh, this is you can't really talk too much at GCSE level because you're not talking about things called complexities. Complexities is what makes algorithms slightly more interesting to learn about, but that's at possibly A level than university. So maximizing efficiency is all about minimizing resource consumption. That's just what efficiency is. You would have probably covered it in physics too. So what it we tend to measure it in, in terms of time, how long it takes to run, and space, how much memory is going to be used. There's other there's other measures of efficiency depending on the purpose, but those are the two main ones we talk about, at least theoretically. And they can't be directly compared, right, because they're two different quantities. You can't directly compare them, so you have to use mathematical analysis, which is the complexities I'm talking about. And there's often a trade-off where you increase one to decrease the other, which isn't ideal, but you have to make a sacrifice. And often the fastest algorithms are the ones that use the most memory. And there are other factors, for example, I want to know some factors. There's quite a few factors that can affect efficiencies, and often very specific ones. Um, but they include how good your data structures are. Some can be better than others, some can be more efficient, especially if you're defining them as a user, if they're not built in. Um, other factors are the software and hardware, so for programs, applications we're running, and actually the translator. We'll look at translators later, but what's actually converting your code into the binary and the actual languages you're using. So there's other factors, but those would be more than enough to talk about in an exam question, I think. Um, so that's it. It's been a massive topic. The next topic is really easy to compensate. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching.